Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome once again to our Nature Hero Talks uh, series. Today, we have a very special, gu uh, special guest, two special guests, all the way from Singapore, uh, Dr. Ngo and Dr. Sean Lam. Thank you very much for making your time. And the topic of the day is, is actually quite critical. It's regarding the tropical fragmented um, uh, forest uh, in Singapore, but also we can apply that throughout Asia as well, especially also in Malaysia. So we do hope to learn um, a little bit from both of you and see if you can implement that. Look at your success stories and so on and see if you can implement that in, um, in, in Malaysia, in the peninsula, okay? And uh, just a bit of background, uh, Dr. Ngo is an e ecologist who has worked on a wide range of forest related issues such as carbon storage, forest recovery, and dy the dynamics of tropical forests. She is, she is a research, uh, senior research associate at the Asian School of the Environment in uh, Nanyang Technical Technological University. And uh, Dr. Kang Min also chairs the butterfly and insect group of the Nature Society of Singapore, and is also an enthusiastic uh, MNS member. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Sean Lam joined Sing the Singapore branch of the Malaysian Nature Society in 1989. That early experience in conservation influenced his desire to remain involved in nature-related work, both as a university lecturer and as a volunteer with the Nature Society of Singapore. Sean was raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, which explains the tendency of his uh, floral wear. So maybe he can show us some of what he has. All right. Um, so just before the talk uh, start, let me share some screen. Okay, so basically a bit of information um, in terms of uh, where MNS is actually a membership based organization. Uh, we actually have uh, do a lot of work uh, behind the scenes, bas basically we are on the environmental impact assessment uh, committee with the government, uh, the government, um, you know, we advise them on major projects like before the forest is cut down, what are the mitigations, what are the issues that we will have, and what are the uh, so-called assets in terms of um, uh, forest, in terms of, uh, sorry, flora and fauna, so that there's some way we can protect them before it's being cut down, okay? So you're welcome to join us. Even though you're from Singapore, you can always join MNS. Uh, we open to to all um, to worldwide uh, members. Uh, family membership is only 80 ringgit per year for the first year, and subsequently is 70 ringgit. And we also want to have more youth actually to participate as well. So it's only 15 and 10 ringgit per per year. So do join us. So let us uh, get back to the talk. So the talk will be about 30, 30 to 40 minutes. And after that, we have a Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, just type into the chat uh, box and then we will collect the inf all the questions and then answer them in one go. And then we also have a simple quiz uh, with prizes donated from Singapore, okay? So kindly pay attention and take notes, all right? So let us um, welcome our two speakers, uh, Dr. Ngo and and Dr. Lam, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Vuti. Okay, thank you, Vuti and Lunping. So good afternoon to all our friends uh, in Malaysia and Singapore. Thank you so much for uh, for spending your afternoon uh, with this presentation that was kindly arranged by MNS Negri Simbilan Malaka Branch. So we're very grateful to Vuti and the entire uh, committee of MNS Negri Simbilan Malacca. Uh, I am Sean Lam, I'm with the Nature Society Singapore, but when I first came to, I, as Vuti said, I grew up in Honolulu, Hawaii. When I first came to Singapore in 1989, one of the first things I did was join the Malaysian Na Malayan Nature Society, uh, Singapore branch. And, and that, as Vuti said, that early experience really convinced me that a citizen-based, uh, movement to conserve our natural heritage is just so important, not only for now, but for the future. I'm joined by Dr. Ngo Kang Min, my colleague, uh, both from work, we work at the Nanyang Technological University in, in 
ecology, but also she's a very important member of the Nature Society Singapore. And so we're, we're going to share a little bit about our work done at Bukit Tima. I've just, I just shared the screen. Kangmin will start and then I will come in uh, to, at the end of the talk. And if you have any questions at any time, just please, as Buti said, please type them in the chat box and we'll try our best to answer. Okay, Kangmin, so um, all yours. Thanks, Sean, for the introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll begin by telling the story about Bukit Tima Nature Reserve. Um, Sean, did you want to go full screen? Thanks. Okay. So, Bukit Tima Nature Reserve is uh, precious to us because it has the largest patch of primary forest left in Singapore. Okay, so before I, I, I go into detail of Bukit Tima, I would like to talk a bit about the history of, of Singapore. Yeah, sure. Next slide. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Gabra. Yeah, so. <laughs> I did it again. The, you see? Okay. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, okay. so, so. Thanks, John. The reason why these forests were, were cleared initially was to cultivate this plant called Gambir. So, this is a woody, it's a vine, it's a climber. Um, it's, it was cultivated uh, to, to get tannin, to tan leather. So, to, this is uh, so forests were, were, were cleared um, to cultivate this this climber and on top of, of that because uh, to process this plant you need to you need firewood a lot of firewood to to boil the leaves to get the tannin so even more forest was cut for the firewood to to process this this plant so this this really led to uh, almost uh, most of the primary forest being cleared in, in Singapore next please John So, but Lambir, uh, Gambia doesn't really last very long. So after 10 to 15 years, uh, it depletes the soil completely and then you cannot grow Gambia anymore. So the next wave of uh, cultivation was rubber. Uh, the, the person who brought rubber to Singapore and, and made it really, uh, made lots of plantations from it is this uh, guy on the left called Henry Ridley. So I think he was at a point of time also head of the botanic gardens, the Singapore Botanic Gardens. So rubber plantations were really, were really widespread in the 1920s, 1930s in Singapore. Next please. So that was all before the, the World War II, right? So after, after the war, um, urban development began to, to occur. So actually, um, during the colonial period when the British were here, so the forests, all the primary forests were cleared, but you know, after the, the, the farmers gave up cultivation, most of the land actually became a secondary forest. But uh, after independence, a lot of these secondary forests also were cleared. Okay, so you can see that in 1971 already, there were quite a big network of roads uh, of, of urban development. Thanks. <laughs> and only the center part of Singapore was left as a water catchment reservoir and some forests left there. But you can also see that there's only some patches, small patches of green in the center. And then a lot of these striped lines in the middle are actually the, uh, just secondary forests. Yeah. Yeah, so my part today will be just, uh, will, will be about Poketima Nature Reserve, which is this tiny little forest on the bottom left of this central catchment. So you can see that actually in 1971, there was already a road that uh, separated the Poketima Reserve from the central catchment, the, the bigger patch of forest. 
initially this was a, a dirt road and then it became a uh, bigger and bigger until in 1985, it became a six lane expressway. So this effectively cut off the, the two patches of forest. So today, this is how uh, Bukit Timah looks like. Um, it's about 164 hectares. So to give that a perspective, Taman Nagara is many, many times uh, bigger than that. Um, and out of this 164 hectares, uh, 48 hectares is primary forest, okay, which is somewhere scattered in, in, in the middle of Bukitima. So one thing to, to, to look at from this Google, Google map is that it is completely surrounded by urban structures. There are roads um, on all four sides, and then on some sides, there are these houses, there are residential areas. Um, there's also, there used to be a training, uh, military training area here called the, the rifle range. So this makes Bukitima a typical example of a forest fragment. So before I go further into um, Bukitima, um, let's go to the other side of the world. Let's go to the Amazon forests. Um, so in the Amazon, uh, there are some scientists, American scientists, who have done a series of experiments uh, in the 1970s to look at what happens if you cut down, if you make fragments out of a forest, what happens to that fragment? Can it survive? Um, so they started this really huge experiment. They, they had they purposely made fragments of different sizes from one hectare to 100 hectares, just to see what is the, you know, the minimum forest size that's needed to support all the original uh, suite of species that you can find in the forest. So what they found uh, in the past, over the past 30, 40 years, is that these fragments are exposed to this effect called the edge effect. So because if you, if you look at a contiguous forest, there's not a lot of, it's, it's very dense, it's dark, uh, it's moist inside because all the, the, the trees are there, the moisture is captured inside. But once you have a, a small fragment, there's a lot of edges around the fragment. And these edges tend to be drier. And this change in microenvironment, change in microclimate, is called the edge effect. So in the Amazon, they found that actually large trees are, are dying more. They are more vulnerable to, to mortality for some reason because they are more sensitive to the, dry, the drier condition. Okay, and they also found that the and animals that specialize in forest habitats, that means continuous forests, they suffer, they, they are, their abundance really dropped. Whereas the generalist and the light living species are increased in abundance, which is um, expected because you know, a lot of these open environments are, have, have increased. So these species that like these environments also increase. The other thing they found is that um, intense rare events like uh, major windstorms, drought, that happen once every few years, they can leave very lasting legacies in these fragments. So we started our research by also asking this, like, will the same things happen to Bukitima, which is so small, uh, 164 hectares? Uh, is Bukitima experiencing the same effects as these fragments in the Amazon? So the way we carried out this research is to set up a permanent plot. Um, so if you look at this map here, this is a map of Bukitima. The blue box shows the position of our plot. So this plot is two hectares. Okay, two hectares is 200 by 100 meters. So it's not a very big plot. If you compare, you know, there are actually worldwide, there are other research plots that are much bigger, it can be 50 hectares or 100 hectares. But we use this, this two hectares just because Bukitima itself is so small already. So you can see um, Bukitima is very hilly. You can see the, the contour lines. And it's probably, it was retained because it was so hilly because it was just so difficult to chop the wood and bring it out. Um, but then there were, at the fringes of the reserve, you'll see that uh, some of the forests have been used. So in the north, there, have been, uh, there was a dairy farm actually. So currently this is a young secondary forest dominated by uh, exotic species. And then in the southeastern part, 
There's also young secondary forest, but this used to be old kampong. Uh, even until the 1950s, it was still a kampong. Um, and then rumor has it that it was burnt and um, the whole village was just abandoned and then just naturally recovered as a secondary forest. So these two patches of secondary forest are about 60, 70 years old now. So my next slide is going to talk about, just focus on the data we have from the two hectare primary forest plot. Okay, so in this plot, what we do is that every tree, there's at least one centimeter in diameter. They were measured, okay, so they, they were tagged, they were mapped and identified to species. It sounds very simple, but it's actually a lot of work. Okay, so if you have one team, one team is let's say three people, to do this will take about one year. Because um, in total, we are monitoring about 12,000 trees just in this plot alone, since 1993. So this research has been going on for a long time, uh, more than 20 years by now. And so that's the two hectare primary forest plot. So if you looked at the map just now, uh, there was another plot that's right next to it. It's uh, mostly containing secondary forest. Yeah, so here it is. So a big part of the plot is in secondary forest. Yeah. Thanks, John. <laughs> can go forward. Yeah, so what did we find? Did we find the same results as uh, what they found in the Amazon? Um, Okay. First, first um, this was a span of about 20 years, okay, and then within these 20 years, there have been two really dry events, drought events, uh, major droughts. So I'm sure most of you will remember that the, the really serious, the really dry 1997 um, period, the haze was really serious. Um, it would be, it would be choking levels. Um, the one in 2009, maybe not, not so noticeable, uh, but there was still the, the haze in these, two, in these two years. So what we found was that there were fluctuations in mortality and recruitment rates of, of trees across these 20 years, but we didn't see any dramatic um, decline in big trees or, or any specific um, sizes of trees. So there was up some, some, some years that were up, there some years were down, but overall they sort of, um, there was no net change across the 20 years. So the next point is also the same, no directional changes in mortality and recruitment rates of these forest trees we monitored over 20 years. The next thing is that um, pioneer species are not increasing in abundance. Maybe I haven't explained what is the meaning of pioneer species. So pioneer species, uh, usually they refer to plants, to trees. These are trees that like um, a lot of light, very open environments, and they tend to grow very fast. That's why they're called pioneer species, species because uh, you know, once a piece of land is opened up, they are the pioneers to, to grow there because they like the, the very open environments. So when you, have, when you see pioneer species in a certain landscape, it tells you that this is actually recently cut. So that's one way you can tell uh, the difference between a primary forest and, and a secondary forest. So what we found is that pioneer species uh, are not increasing in abundance, which means that, which tells us that actually maybe the edge effects that uh, was found in the Amazon um, is not so apparent at Bukitima. So actually Bukitima is quite resilient uh, compared to the Amazon. So some other findings we, we got from our plot data is that we have a total of uh, about 353 species in, in the plot, just two hectares. It's actually very species rich. Some of these species uh, increase in abundance, some decrease. Um, so for example, uh, Shoria curtisii, which is the most abundant um, canopy species at Bukitima. It's a hill species, you can, only, you can also find it in Malaysia and the Greece and Milan. This species at Bukitima increased in abundance by 20% by over 20 years. That's, that's a lot. So that shows that this, you know, this very characteristic big tree in, in Bukitima is not, is not dying out. In fact, it's, it's increasing. 
but there are some other species that are decreasing. And uh, many species, okay, especially the most abundant ones like Shelvia curtisii, they, their abundance changes were greater than what was predicted by chance. So a lot of these uh, changes in abundance, right, especially for the most common species, are not due to chance alone, which means that you know, there's, a, there's a high possibility that these changes are being driven by environmental effects, such, such as climate change or global warming. Yeah, so we found that uh, there was no you know, dramatic uh, changes of, uh, in Advocatima uh, compared to what they found in the Amazon. But if we look at the secondary forests at Bukitima. So right now I will present some, uh, briefly some findings from what, what we have from the secondary forest plot, which is just next to the primary forest. There's no um, big barrier between these two forests. In fact, it's just a very small dirt track um, that's public, about one or two meters wide. But other than that, actually seeds, animals can move very freely in between these two forests. So what we found in the secondary forest is that it's recovering really slowly. So this, this is what it looks like even after 60 years, 70 years of uh, natural recovery. So even though the primary forest is right next to it, you know, the this, this primary forest species are somehow just not getting in, are not growing in the secondary forest. And this is uh, less than five meters away, especially for the diprocups. You can see the understory is very sparse. Um, not a lot of big trees here. So this forest developed right after the kampong was abandoned and then canopy was formed. But this is the, the first wave of pioneer species. And by now they are almost reaching the end of their lives. So what is really lacking in this forest is the, is the primary forest species. So for some reason, uh, we, we don't know, it may be the seeds are not going in there, even though the distance is so short. Or it could be something in the soil because previously it was agricultural land. Because of the um, agricultural practices, maybe they altered the soil. Or it could be the leaf litter. You can see a very thick leaf litter um, on, on the ground here. So it, we are still doing all this research to find out uh, the reason for why this secondary forest um, is recovering so slowly. Um, but the, the take home message from this is that, you know, primary forest can be resilient, but once you cut it down, the secondary forest will take a very, very long time to recover. So if possible, it's, it's best not to cut them down at all, the primary forest, if possible, and then uh, preserve your secondary forest for as long as you can. Because once it's cut, it's, 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 yeah, it's very difficult. But take a very long time for them to recover. I think that's the end for my part. Yeah, thanks. I'll pass it on to Sean now. Thank you, Kang Min. So uh, I, I just typed into the chat box a little while ago that the same methods that uh, Kang Min actually leads this long-term study, uh, the same methods that were used at Bukitima were first pioneered in, in Asia in Southeast Asia, uh, at, in, in a Greece and Milan, because it's in the uh, Paso Forest Reserve, um, uh, established by research staff from the FRIM, the Forest Research Institute, uh, Malaysia. And so we follow the same protocol that's been used at Paso. And again, as Kangin said, uh, it turns out that the forest fragment has been, at least in terms of tree species composition um, and abundance has been remarkably resilient or surprisingly at least to us. So then the question may be a more general one, at least in our region, how susceptible are different species to the reduction in habitat size? So in other words, to fragmentation and how resilient are these forest fragments? I mean, Kangmin has spoken about the trees. What about for other species that contribute to the overall function of the forest? So I'm gonna maybe, uh, I'd like to highlight a few other studies that might shed light on some of these. So the first thing maybe we might ask is, when you fragment these forests, what happens to the animal diversity? And of course, you know, I, I find it really hard to 
uh, imagine, but wherever we are right now, whether we're in Seremban or Johor Bahru or Singapore or wherever we are sitting at the moment, if we went back in time long enough, the very spot that we are standing in or sitting in might have once been a tiger. You know, tigers would have been resting here. We would have found leopards, elephants, hornbills. The whole peninsula would have been just full um, of this wildlife, which we have to go th through much effort and patience to try to see in our remaining parks and nature, uh, national parks and nature reserves. Um, but again, th this, this is the primeval forests and all the components such as tapirs or bunting or sambar deer, anything uh, would have been a part of that whole fabric of the forest ecosystem. So what happens when these species are lost? So even in Singapore, all of these species were, were found here once. We had rhinoceros hornbills, we had tapirs, we had tigers, and, and so clouded leopards and so many more things. And clearly they are not found in Bukitima anymore. And it's not just even the big animals. This, just to really quickly summarize, two surveys of the animal and plant life at Bukitima Nature Reserve. The first conducted about 30 years ago um, in 2018. And some of the groups surveyed included plants, birds, mammals, frogs, and so on. And even just over this 20, 25 year interval, there were some slight decreases in bird abundance for sure. Uh, definitely in terms of mammals, even though they were also, these were counterbalanced by some new discoveries. Through circumstantial evidence, things like beetles and bees are believed to also have been lost because common primary forest beetles and bees uh, are not found in Bukitima, but are found in the larger neighboring, uh, what's called the central catchment forest. So there are declines in the diversity, but these tend to be, have tended to be slow, fortunately, which means that these forest fragments, no matter what their current situation, have tremendous conservation value. So again, I guess that's another take home message is that forest fragments are not a lost cause. Uh, they're not a gone case for sure. They have great conservation value. The one way I try to think about it is if you were to take animals out of an ecosystem, uh, can the, to what extent can the forest still function? Are there still pollinators? Are there still seed dispersers? Are there still there, you know, decomposers and everything? And I, the only analogy I could think of in, in this world of climate change, maybe automobiles and carbon emissions, not a really, not the ideal um, <laughs> analogy. But here, here's a car, for example, from the 1970s. Uh, my father actually drove one of these and it was a gas guzzler, but it had all the, you know, all the moving parts and everything. But if you were to take away the headlights, it can still could still drive. Even if you took away the uh, a windscreen, it could or take off the bonnet, take off the, the 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 doors. It would still go. And in fact, this car got so beat up, my father's car, that it um, it really was kind of pretty decrepit at the end. And it to, you could even take out the engine, and you'd still have a Flintstones type car. It will still get you from A to B. So what is the basic, you know, what's the bare minimum that a forest needs in order to still function, especially a forest fragment? So that's the kind of things that Kang Min, myself, and our um, collaborators are really interested in. So let me give you one example. All the large um, seed predators are, are, are not present, except for the long-tail macaque, which is a very effective seed uh, disperser, sorry, seed disperser. So is a civet cat. But uh, the other large animals, the, the big hornbills, like the rhinoceros, uh, not around. We don't have a uh, uh, siamang, you know, so. But we have done some camera trapping and other studies, and we do find some of these seeds on the ground can still be moved around by ground rodents uh, or, or arboreal rodents that come to feed, like squirrels. And our squirrels aren't even the big ones like you still have in Malaysian forests. We, we, this is just the common plantain squirrel, but yet it still is together with the uh, macaque and maybe civet cat, moving seeds around such that in our regeneration patterns, we, we can't really see an obvious uh, change in the distribution of young plants, which, which I think is a, a, 
encouraging sign. So again, some animals can pick up the slack in terms of ecosystem function, which is not to say that now we can go and remove animals. Obviously, it's much better to have the full complement. But at least in a short-term situation, some of the uh, slack can be picked up by the remaining smaller animals. So again, that's encouraging. This is, um, let me try to explain this one. How about things like pollen movement, not just within the fragment, but across fragments. So this is a study done by our colleague at the National University of Singapore. His name is uh, Ted Webb. And he, his group studied three fragments. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, I've labeled them. Bukitima is one. Uh, the catchment forest, which is a larger fragment, is uh, in the upper right-hand corner. And then below that, a few kilometers, Singapore Botanic Garden. So many of you who come to Singapore are very familiar with certainly the Botanic Garden. Um, and just for reference, can you see between Bukit Timah and uh, Macritchie, what separates them from the Botanic Garden is a huge built-up area. But what Ted Webb and his group found, and the lines, the black lines, represent the movement of pollen. So how they did their study is they looked at a young kumpas, the kumpasia, this giant forest tree uh, seedlings, and they were able to genetically determine who was their mother and who was their father. And so they could trace back uh, where the parent was. And it turns out that, say, some, parent, some plants in Bukitima, their father, the pollen, donor was from McRitchie, this, this several kilometers away. Some plants at the Botanic Garden, their parent was actually uh, also at McRitchie or even Bukitima, that kind of distance. So it means that the pollinator, in this case, it's probably large bees, the, the giant honeybee, which you have all over Malaysia also, was able to cross an urban landscape to get from one forest fragment to another. Again, this is not an ideal situation, but it does mean that fragmentation is not necessarily the death knell for uh, some of the forest function. Now, smaller pollinators, maybe it could be a very different story, but at least for a large number of the trees of forest, they might still be able to retain a decent level of pollen movement because of the properties of some of the pollinators, like large um, honeybees, the giant honeybee, or something like this, the cave nectar bat. Again, this one is known to fly long distances. We can find these flying around uh, in the city center in Singapore, even though their roost is in the forest reserve or near the forest reserve. So again, not all, but some can still manage to help the forest function either in terms of uh, pollination or in other cases, seed dispersal. This now um, shows, and I'll try to explain, this is another study, a very recent one, published a few months ago by Do uh, Professor Frank Reint. He's a geneticist from the National University of Singapore. So again, this is a genetic study, and they wanted to look at the movement of some of these small forest species and edge species the three birds from the forest, dependent on deep forest, are the short-tailed babbler, that's on the upper left-hand corner of this pan, up the left of the panel, the chestnut-winged babbler, which is a mid-level um, species, and a canopy species, species were something called the abbot's babbler, the striped tit babbler, and the olive wing bobo, and of the three edge species is the olive wing, that's the canopy species. This one is going very well in Singapore because it, it, it thrives in these forests and habitats. So there's no danger of this species being lost, which is good because it's also a important seed disperser. What, um, now if you look at the squiggly lines below each of these birds in, in the panel, it just, can you see there's a, a, a on the left, if we look at the striped tip babbler, the black lines show movement back and forth within a small patch of forest. This forest is actually connected to another forest, which is the, this is all part of the central catchment forest, but they're separated by a very, very slight road in a golf course north and one to the south of the central catchment 
a ring babbler. It's got all these different colored dots all mixed up. It means that this Singapore wide population is actually quite well integrated. It doesn't seem to be, for example, um, Bobo, all the urban landscape to get from one place to another. Um, so the species biology is important. So that means if we go back to our forest fragments, we can make predictions as to even without any additional study, which species are particularly vulnerable and which need to be closely monitored to see what we need to do to help them get overcome this uh, fragmentation effect. Black or white, some species will do all right, others will decay quite. The late 1800s, and yet we're still finding uh, new things that we overlooked. So, for example, there's Kang Min, she's standing for this giant tree. It's one of the biggest in the whole Bukitima, but nobody actually identified that until 1993. And when they did, they found it's a short series, a species of Miranti called Shoria ochrofloia. It's one of the uh, Salangan Batu, the very hardwood uh, Shorias. So only 20 years ago, really 25 years ago, it was first identified. So too, this little flying squirrel, the red cheeked flying squirrel, uh, uh, Nature Society survey found that in the 1990s. This plant here that my colleague Nick Faizu, who works at Frim, is holding, it's a species of rengas or gluta, again, over in a large tree survey in 2008. And other things completely overlooked, this hanguana, this plant in the lower left-hand corner, only confirmed as a new species last year. No, this year, this year. So who knows? In all these forest fragments all over the peninsula, there are probably many new discoveries that are still waiting for us to uncover them. And because amateur naturalists are the most active in terms of exploring these areas, MNS members can make really major contributions to science still, as they have done throughout the 80 year history of the MNS. L last few slides, I, I wanna just take, take us on a sort of very whirlwind trip around the peninsula. If, this is a map from a very classic study of the Dipterocarp or Maranti family trees by the British forester C.F. Symington, masterpiece. Uh, and it's published by the MNS, the most recent reprint. There is a habitat called the coastal hill forest. You can see that kind of second from the bottom. And this map shows sort of species that of Dipterocarp that are from various groups of the family that are found in each habitat type. So if we look at the coastal hill, it's the third, it's from the bottom. You see there's Hopia griffithii, Hopia becariana, and then to the panel to the next one, you see Shoria criticii. These are very typical species of coastal hill forest. There you go. And um, there's also a species of Kururin called Dipterocarpus penangianus or condorensis, some people call it. The first study of Bukitima or of hill forest was actually done by a group of members of the MNS, the Malayan Nature Society, Singapore branch, led by Mr. Wong Yuquan, a trained forester who started his career at the Forest Research Institute in Kapong. And I just want to highlight they had a hypothesis about the survival of, of Bukitima, and they felt that it should be fairly resilient, both because of what coastal hill forests are and also um, because of the regeneration that was evident in the survey that they made. Again, it was done, it, it was amazing, three, four years of field work every Sunday, uh, one Sunday a month, uh, done by, it's a citizen science initiative, you know, done by an MS branch. And they were, again, the first to come up with the uh, a working hypothesis that forest fragments like Bukitima could actually be quite resilient. And that's something interesting too that Mr. Wong pointed out 
was that what may be the biggest threat to some of these fragments is something like fire. So he points out at Tanjung Tuan or Cape Rochado, there being a fire in 1963 that uh, damaged part of the forest and it was invaded or colonized by these fast growing trema, the pioneer species. Might be worth Vuti going back and having a look at Tanjung Tuan to see what this patch looks like today, uh, 50, almost 60 years later. Now, I want to very quickly start with Negris and Bilan and we'll go down and then up and around the peninsula just to see how these coastal hill forests are distributed, these little fragments. This is uh, Tanjung Tuan and Shoria Criticii or Saraya uh, that Kang Min mentioned earlier is typified by having a, almost a white colored, almost looks like cauliflower from above, right? It's, it's this white crown tree. And if you look at Tanjung Tuan, you can actually see the Shoria Criticii, the Saraya, and they normally are found in a single file on the ridge of a, of a hill. So very, very typical. This is the presence of Saraya indicates a relatively healthy coastal hill forest. You can see though on the right hand side of Tanjung Tuan on the uh, eastern side, it's, it's a little bit, maybe this is the part that was affected by the uh, fire. I, I need to check with people who remember that. Now the line shows a 10 kilometers separation between Tanjung Tuan to the west and to the east, I think it's the Pasipanjang Recreational Forest. And if we look at that forest, again, can you see, I'm gonna zoom in. Can you see the Shore Criticia, the Saraya? It's, it's unmistakable white crown. And there it is again, a, a, large, a large patch of this Saraya, very similar to Tanjung Tuan and clearly very similar to the Bukitima Forest that we studied in Singapore. And the um, findings from Bukitima that forest decay is gradual, I'm sure applies, quite confident that it applies to these forest fragments as well. In just the last few slides, I'd like to go down to Johor, up the, then up the west coast, and then around down the east coast. And let's look for some of these Saraya. So here's Batu Pahat, in, we've crossed the border now, we're in Johor, and there's the Bukit Banang, just behind the town, and again, look, there it is the white cauliflower, the Shoria criticii, just there behind downtown Batu Pahat. Now we're gonna go up the coast to Perak and let's go to Pula Panko, to Panko Island. And if we take a look, can you see the Saraya in clusters, those white crowns? And we go further north, we're going to uh, Pula Pinang. So we're going to Penang and we we'll, let's go to the north, Western tip, Chilak Bahang, uh, was called the Pantai Ache Forest. And there, look, there's all that Shoya Criticii. Again, uh, a coastal hill forest. Now we're going to go to the East Coast. This is Kuantan. Uh, Teluk Champadak is the little cape uh, to the, at the easternmost tip of uh, Kuantan. And just behind it is a hill, Bukit Palindung. And once again, can anybody see the Saraya? This is very similar in composition, surely, to Tanjung Tuan. So this is a shared heritage besides being um, floristically similar. And now we're going to go south into Laipeng territory in Johor to Gunung Arung, which is immersing. Ta-da, there it is. There's the Saraya everywhere. So. The beauty of MNS is that it's got a long tradition of citizen based quality scientific work and surveying. And so, if the first detailed study of coastal hill forests was done by MNS members, there's no reason why we couldn't go back and look at the fate and monitor some of these others, whether it's in Kuantan, Mersing, Batu Pahat, Port Dixon and so on. And just to wrap up, it turns out, luckily, through Kang Min's analysis that coastal hill forests and fragments in general in Asia have a surprising degree of resilience. The conservation value uh, can, is, is great enough 
and the decay slow enough that there's still time to not only salvage, but maybe to improve the fate of these fragments. MNS conducted the first known documented study of a coastal hill forest. We have excellent naturalists working together across branches. We have the ability to reach out and inspire fellow Singaporeans and Malaysians. There's a whole history and capacity to do great citizen-based science. Coastal hills are also the first place that many Malaysians and Singaporeans get a chance to see quality forests. So again, the outreach value, tremendous, tremendous. And finally, uh, I'm gonna move my box here. There is a possibility, who knows, uh, Limping uh, uh, and Vuti, that maybe this is an opportunity to, to work across branches, work across MNS and NSS to see together, can we make sure that these coastal hills and these forest fragments have a long and safe and biodiverse future. Uh, Kangmin and I are very grateful to the MNS Negri Bilan Malacca branch for allowing us to share today. Uh, thank you very much, and we're happy to take questions. Although maybe Kangmin might do more because she knows more about the forest than me. Okay, uh, before the questions, uh, let me put up the um, the quiz. Okay, I'm going to put it up onto the chat box. So while uh, people are answering the quiz, uh, we can all go to the um, Q&A. Thank you very much. Oops. Okay, the quiz is now in the chat box. Uh, go ahead, we come back in 10 minutes. Uh, in the meantime, let us take Q&A limping up uh, back to you. Thanks. Lenping, you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we now uh, go into the Q and A session, and uh, the first question posted is uh, quite a long question, so uh, I'll read it out. So this is a question regarding H effect. And the question is, are there studies conducted about age effects on our forest in Singapore? As a guide, how much buffer forest trip or what is the size of buffer is required to reduce the age effect on the forest? Example, 30 meter from say, the conserved forest age or 50, more than 50 meters is required. Are there any guidelines of the flora composition of such buffer zone? such as need to be certain three species, et cetera, and cannot be grassland, maybe, I guess. Thank you. That's the question. Okay, uh, Kangmin, you wanna have the first stab at this or? Yeah, okay, I can say something. So from our research uh, and in fact, from our observations, uh, if you just go to the Hindheat, if you are at Bogotima and you go to the Hindheat quarry, you will see very clearly at the top of the quarry there are Sharia Curtisii. So these are the, the Saraya that Sean was talking about. So I we don't feel that uh, edge effect has uh, much influence on the primary forests in, in Singapore, um, at least for these uh, diprocups. And the rule of the time is uh, you know, the bigger the better. If you can have 50. Buffer, 50 meter buffer, that's always better than 30. And it really depends on what that piece of land or that piece of forest is going to be used for. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree, uh, Kang Min. So I, I think um, one, one of the downsides of edge effect is the, the wind actually can blow into the forest and that has a drying out effect. And if you look at a very small fragment, like at the Singapore Botanic Gardens, the rainforest, um, that forest is actually probably too small now to, to be well buffered against uh, wind. And so in this a little bit, so now unlike though in South, South America where the people were able to find edge effects with like something like 300 meters into the forest, um, we don't find um, that same degree of re, uh, vulnerability. However, um, whether 10 meters or 30 or 50, as Kang Min says, I think the buffer has to be trees and not so much grassland. 
anything to block the wind, the denser, the better. So it's not necessarily just the width of the buffer, but rather the density. Just kind of seal in the humidity, I think, is uh, very crucial. Okay, thanks, Dr. Lam and Dr. Mo. So the next question is, uh, what are the plant species that were lost, possible reason for their loss, and any plans to introduce them? Okay, I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start and then Kaimin can jump in. Uh, that's a very good question, uh, Harris, thank you. It turns out, and I think again, it's, it's linked to what we were saying earlier, that uh, small forest fragments are disproportionately impacted by the drying effect of wind. Uh, so two kinds of plants are very much lost uh, following fragmentation more than others. So one would be plants that require high humidity and also plants that are naturally found in very low density. So for example, in Singapore, there were once, oh, many dozens of ficus or fig species, uh, but they typically in at least the, the large uh, strangling type are found in fairly low density in the forest and the pollinators can, can be blown by the wind across many, many kilometers. So they're found in low density. So it could be that, you know, whatever forest that's not cut happens not to have any of these species. And so these were lost ficus very much in high uh, uh, proportion. And the other one, interestingly, orchids. Singapore at one point had 200, more than 200 species of orchids, but only maybe 10% to 20% can still be found as opposed to some 80% loss of orchids, uh, whereas overall maybe 25% of all other plants. Uh, epiphytes, particularly orchids, and those that are found in low densities would be the most vulnerable in our, um, in our uh, experience, our experience, and the other thing, understory plants, gingers, you know, those things they need, they need connectivity, and they need high humidity. Okay, uh, is so. So we go to the next question. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, the next question is from Che Bon. Uh, the question is, what are the criteria of the buffer zones and what are the suitable parameter variable to determine the criteria of the buffer zone? Okay, um, maybe I'll just speak in general terms and come into any specifics. Sure. I think much of it depends also on the, the type of forest. So if we're talking about uh, maybe a urban fragment. So imagine the Bukit Banang in Batu Pahat or, or the Bukit Palindung near Kuantan. It's surrounded kind of like Bukit Tima by a lot of development. So in this sense, there's space for a very wide buffer. And so in this case, even if the buffer is narrow, they shield the forest from, from the um, drying effects of wind. And where possible through a a matrix of other greenery to maybe try to connect these fragments to other larger forests. When you get to much bigger parks, um, then now the buffer becomes different. It could be it could be um, community forestry initiatives, community based. So basically, to get the stakeholders to be active in the buffer as a frontline defense of a area. So you can see in the national park maybe. Um, just wanted to add what uh, National Park Board in Singapore is doing is coming up with these or oh, rather um, designating some of these parks at the fringes uh, as buffer parks. So these parks, uh, they, they used to be old rubber plantations, they used to be old kampongs. There's a lot of fruit trees and rubber trees now in these parks. Uh, but even that is some kind of canopy cover and shield from the wind, as John says. So that, that is a good uh, move to, to reduce uh, edge effects. These parts. Yeah. Doctor, so the next question is, uh, uh, have in 
invasive species of I want to go first. Sure, okay. Um, so this was a surprise, actually, everybody. So um, um, we, th we would have thought that a small forest would be very vulnerable, especially planted the landscape with all these exotic plants. Plants that I know back in Honolulu, where I was raised, have become very invasive in Hawaiian forests. But surprisingly, aside from rubber, which is not invasive, but it's a remnant and it survives, oil palm, which also can persist. There's only this clydemia, the hairy clydemia, which you have also all over Malaysia, which is a South American plant. But in, other than that, we've yet to see uh, invasive species take over the forest. And the same, I suppose, is true to a lesser extent with the animals. We have a few things like, like white crested laughing thrush and everything, which are starting to infiltrate some of these forests, but they have been surprisingly um, resistant to uh, large-scale invasion. I don't know if you agree, Carmen. Yes, uh, I think that's, that's very true. And actually, if you consider the whole landscape of Singapore, all the streets are planted with, you know, all these exotic species, species from South America, species from Africa, but you don't find them in Bukit um, So that we don't really have a big issue with invasive species so far. Okay, so um, go to the next question. Uh, this is a question from, okay, uh, from No Alfarani. Is there any issue when foreign researchers take out the specimen from the forest? So any researcher, whether you are local or foreign, you need a research permit from the National Parks Board. So once you have a permit and the permit says that you can take out specimens, then, then you can do it. And otherwise, it's against the law. But then, yeah, I guess the question is, despite these rules, and there are very strict rules um, around our region, right, uh, against uh, poaching, whether plant or animal, there are still people who are tempted to take things out. Luckily, in Singapore, we, we have um, a fairly small community of researchers. So in that sense, there is... Um, a, a good system of application for permits and everything, but and also we don't happen. We tend not to, unlike Malaysia, we don't have many of the prizes that are sought after by collectors. Say the orchids, the begonia, the palms, um, all cycads, all those things that are highly sought after in the black market for um, you know horticultural plants. So in that sense, we're spared not because we necessarily have better behaved people, but maybe also we don't have some of those uh, really highly sought after, you know, by collector type plants. I, I, I hope that answered your uh, question. Okay, so the next question uh, from Wai Ling. Uh, is there any reason why native trees are not planted in the secondary forest in Bukit Timah? Uh, so actually, there, there are some reforestation uh, programs that have happened in Bukit Timah and also in the central nature. It's, it just wasn't in our two hectare plots. But uh, National Parks Board does uh, plant uh, primary forest species in batches or in programs. So it's not that we are not planting, it's just uh, not. This is not the focus of today's talk. Yeah. Um. You know, just, just to add, uh, Kangmin's doing this analysis now. If you, we just left the forest alone, how long would it take uh, to recover back to the original state? I saw the numbers. It's, it's not yet finished, but it's kind of shocking. <laughs> and so, yes, uh, Wailing, your point that shouldn't we just be enriching uh, the secondary forest by introducing more of the slow-growing, uh, old growth species and the answer is absolutely and, and I think we know enough now to say that that would be a good long-term um, effort to increase the resilience and the future of our, our forests especially these fragmented ones um, uh, and hopefully we can see this throughout the region and maybe Malaysia and Singapore can lead and the same effort be replicated across the whole of the Sunda area. Okay, 
this is an, um, the, another question for from HP. Uh, the question is, given that we can expect Singapore to be developing more and more of our land and many secondary forests or wet wasteland are fragmented, do you think the nature ways which are envisioned to be linear green corridors, do they really help in connecting these fragmented forests since they are just relatively thin strips of green areas? Okay, um, I'll start and then come and follow if that's all right. So, so it, this is a very Singapore-centric kind of question, but in a way, yes, and in a way, no. Um, we have these connecting, they're called nature ways, but they're used by people for recreation and meant to be area for animals to move from one green patch to another. And so I don't think it's a case of they're great or they're terrible but they maybe are better suited for some species than for others. And I guess the real question is for those animals who are threatened, like the short-tailed babbler by fragmentation, are these connectors effective in allowing the movement across that urban matrix? And um, my, I think we would need to have a really thorough study, but my guess is some of the more sensitive species will remain um, restricted to their little fragments. But then we cross the whole landscape and you think in KL, there's the Aitam Forest Reserve, there's Sungai Manyala, just not too far from uh, Port Dixon. There are these really, really rich forests uh, isolated. So the long-term conservation challenge is, is there a way we can connect them back to the wider landscape? So there would be urban connectors as well as connectors in suburban. I think uh, uh, MNS is trying to do this also in the Sungai Yu to, to restore a corridor for tiger movement back and forth to um, N N uh, Tama Nagara. So I think, yeah, at whatever scale, I think we can um, do better in terms of c connecting fragmented or isolated uh, forest patches. And, I, and I'm very proud to say MNS is leading the way in the region and doing some of this uh, very important research. To add on to, okay. to Sean, um, so I've, I've been on, I've walked by one of these uh, nature ways uh, in Jurong and it, it's just one or two meters wide and it's this particular one in Jurong is sandwiched in between a condominium and a very busy road. So even though there were some dipro cups planted in this nature way, uh, there were some understory shrubs, you know, the overall environment is still not conducive for really forest specific species. So if it's for conservation of those kinds of species, I, I think that nature ways are alone are not enough. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next question is for Agnes. Uh, she's re requesting, uh, asking uh, with uh, this uh, uh, paper, Plant Ecology and Diversity 9, 397403 where to obtain or access it online. Oh, okay. This is uh, this is actually Kangmin's research that was published in um, tw uh, four years ago. So yes, Agnes, uh, maybe just for copio, uh, we sent. No, no, just kidding. Uh, we'll 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 send you the paper or make it available to uh, our uh, NSS and MNS friends. Anybody who's interested. Okay, hey, thanks, Doctor. And uh, another question from Yong Moy. Does Singapore have a seed bank? Uh, uh, oh, yes. Actually, very, thanks, Yong Moy. Um, very recently, the Singapore Botanic Gardens uh, set up a, a seed bank as a, as a hedge against potential future species loss. And again, Kang Min can add more. There, but the trouble is, as you know, like, you know, if you open up like a, a jackfruit and you start eating the jackfruit, you notice that some of the seeds already, there's a small root that's wrapping around the seed. It started to germinate inside the fruit. So a lot of tropical uh, plants have what's called a recalcitrant seed. They, they don't have a dormancy and they don't last more. If you don't plant them within, you know, fortnight, within two weeks, they, they will not survive. So even with seed banks, we still haven't figured out the very, very serious question of how do we preserve these tropical seeds 
that have no dormancy. And I think that's the big uh, uh, conservation challenge. So seed banks for tropical forests, um, not a, a cure all. And I think the best insurance right now is to make sure that as many of these small forests uh, can be retained. Or the second thing is to take forest trees and put them in our parks so that at least there's a living collection somewhere and not all in one place, but scattered. So they're not, the risk is, in, it, the risk is spread out across the landscape. I mean, if you think okay. every school in Saranban planting tropical rainforest trees, uh, that would be a really great long-term insurance to preserve all the species that may be found in Tanjung Tuan forest. Okay. Uh, the last question I see here is, um, would you have info on your Hornbill project? That is the key success factor and lesson learned is from Wailing. Kang Min, you want to? I, I think Sean, you know this project better. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the hornbill that we have is, is the, the widespread and, and maybe the most resilient to, to urbanization, the oriental pied hornbill. But even then, uh, we, we had lost hornbills from Singapore in the late 1800s. So they were gone for about 100 years. And then some uh, Nature Society members found a few on a small island called Pulau Ubin, which is on the east coast of the northeast coast of S Singapore. And from that small population, uh, it grew a little bit, but the limiting thing with the hornbill is that they, they need large oak trees in order to, with cavities in order to make the nest. And in the case of the hornbill, the food wasn't limiting. It, it turns out to be the nest sites. So a comprehensive program to reintroduce, uh, to introduce artificial nest boxes and hoping that the hornbills will take to them was in, instituted. And that actually uh, led to the I wouldn't say explosion, but rapid increase in the oriental pied hornbill population. That's a great hornbill, but I think efforts to introduce some of the bigger ones, you know, wreath hornbill, uh, rhinoceros hornbill, these have yet to, these have yet to um, be implemented. It would be much more challenging for sure. Okay, so uh, I think that's the last question that I see here. Uh, and anything else uh, for Futi? Yep, I think uh, we uh, we went over time, but I I did allow over, over time because uh, it's quite interesting. Actually, I'm I'm just writing down all the things that you mentioned. It's very inspiring, and uh, especially you mentioned about all these um, this little pockets of of forests that we have around Malaysia, of course in Singapore, but uh, you highlighted quite a number around Malaysia where all our MNS members are located so that we can actually do something to, to, to actually preserve those forests, which is very good. And also we have uh, Bukit Senge in, um, in Malacca, which we thought um, maybe it's, you know, it's kind of worthless now because it's, uh, it's so small. But after listening to uh, Dr. Sean and Dr. Ngo, actually there's some glimmer of hope that we will go back as, as MNS to, to actually have a look at this forest because they do have hornbills there uh, as well. So we will look at that and see how we can convince the government to preserve that little small patch of forest that is left in Malacca, you know. Of course, the, 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 the coastal ones, we know that where they are. But the, the Bukit Senge is something that has not been uh, much attention paid to it. So we will look into that as a, as a branch activity. So thank you so much. And uh, the take home message is that it is um, positive news, especially from the edge effect that uh, you guys have done great uh, work to, to, uh, to have a better understanding on that. And we do hope that, uh, yeah, gives us a lot of hope. And thank you so much. Uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Ngo and Sean for spending your afternoon. I also thank to all the participants as well. Um, so now let, let's go to the prizes. Uh, uh, Dr. Sean, uh, Dr. Lam, what is the prize we have and how many? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. So, so well, we, I mean, if every, we, we have things like our, our Nature Watch magazine scene, which is the equivalent of your, um, your glossy magazine. So from the 
NSS side, we have uh, small nature guides that are produced by Singapore Science Center and also some pocket guides, folding pocket guides to butterflies, birds, bees and wasps. And we'll, we'll kind of make this a uh, uh, lucky dip uh, for the winners. Okay. No, normally, Vuti, how many do we give out? Uh, five, is it okay? Five. Is it five okay? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Absolutely. So I, I will share the screen, see who are the winners okay. are before we, yes. we head and off. For, um, maybe for anybody, yeah. Okay. Okay. Oops. Oh, this is so exciting. I'm supposed to, um, okay. I, I don't know how to hide this uh, mobile number anyway. Sorry about that. Okay. So we have um, Liu Yok Mui, uh, Adrian, Liu Yok, Yok Keng, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, Farani, no, Nora Farani, and five is Yap Kien Wee. Yap Kien Wee is from Singapore, so you can only to post to him. So one, <laughs> uh, let me see, just recap. Uh, one, uh, Liu Yok Mui, Adrian Liu Yok Keng, Farani, and Yap Kien Wee. Okay, these are our five winners who came in first with the 10 out of 10 scores. So thank you so much. I'll get the details and send to you, and then uh, we will, um, uh, uh, need, need your help to, to send out to the winners, okay? We will get the, the details from thank you. for you, all right? So again, thank you so thank, much. Thank uh, you, Vuti, and maybe, may, yeah, yes. thank you. Go ahead, go ahead. I just want to say, you know, as a, and not so much consolation, but when we're finally able to travel back and forth again, um, me and Kang Min be happy to take anybody from the uh, Negris and Bilan Malacca branch. Let's go for a walk and explore one of these uh, forests together. <laughs> Yes, welcome. We're waiting for you. Um, maybe, hopefully by March, you can come uh, during the Raptor Watch and then we can do many things during that time. <laughs> all right, so thank you so much again uh, to our two doctors, Dr. Ngo, Dr. Lam, and to all our participants, thank you for spending your afternoon here. And also, it's Madeka Day coming up. So happy Madeka Day to all our Malaysian friends as well. All right, so take care until, oh, the next talk is uh, the 12th of September. We're gonna go to Langkawi, all right, so we're gonna to go to the sea, go to the, the Langkawi Island, and uh, two interesting talks coming up, one on sea cucumber, is a sea cucumber, and the other one is on the coral bleaching. All right, so how we can actually overcome that. All right, so interesting talks coming up, and thank you again, until next time, bye-bye for now, thank you. Thank you all, thank you. Happy Merdeka Day. Happy Madeka Day, yes. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye. 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 You're hiding away there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.